Hi everyone, it's Nicole from Wiki. We've got episode two of BBL Super Coach Watch. Um, I was just saying to Sushane, I know it's getting it's getting a little bit chilly in India already. It's it's a perfect uh spring day in Sydney at the moment. <laughs> where we're sort of ready and, well, we're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are. Um hi Nicole, hi everyone. Um it's we're back on like pretty much a week later to record our second BBL Super Coach podcast. These are the ones that I'm most keen on. Honestly, I mean, yeah, the ticket podcast there, and we're kind of keeping things ticking over. But this is this is fantasy. This is super coach. This is this is yeah. It's just this, this this is good fun. This is what we're here for. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Well, we'll get straight into it. This episode, we're going to be focusing on trades. You know, we do generally say that you don't want to be planning out the whole season because obviously so many things can go wrong. But it is a nice opportunity from our point of view to just kind of like run you over. We're going to do th- we're going to aim for like thirty minute pods. Um, run you through some of our thoughts on what you can target early on and how your team might sort of go throughout the season. Um, I will very quickly say, if you Google Wiki Linktree, the podcast that we're doing now on YouTube, or if you want to listen to it on various platforms, a bunch of NBA and NFL, uh, we've got odds comparison tools now for both of those sports, podcasts for both of those sports. Uh, We've got WBBL and the Cricket World Cup semifinals, India versus New Zealand, Australia versus South Africa. We'll have content for those games as well. So all the stuff that you usually want to check out with Wiki um, and obviously our Discord is all free, all ready to check out. We've got a bumper summer, Aussie summer coming up. Um, Just Google Wiki Linktree. It's all free and ready to go. Let's Let's get straight into the pod. So Okay. We're sitting, at, we're sitting at sort of like roughly three weeks or just over three weeks now until the first game of the BBL. I was telling Sashane that usually with the BBL, I, I wait till a little bit closer to the season to plan just because of predicted teams and stuff. But this time, mm. we've got the added benefit of having, having Sashane on board. He's been pumping out a whole bunch of preseason stuff. And I thought, awesome opportunity for me to give myself an opportunity this year, uh, try to actually crack the top 100 or something a bit more impressive. And um, actually, Sweet. Nice and early. So kick us off with um, the spirit. Uh, all things trades. Yeah, so uh, trades. So I thought about, hey, we've been doing themes for the preseason podcast. Last week it was prices. This week it's trades. Um, the first thing that stands out with trades is just shorter season. Shorter season, nine rounds, 26 trades in all, just under three trades around as a, as a super coach. Um, the shorter season brings, like I think the shorter season brings up one very obvious Burning question related to trades, to related to trades. Uh, is this the season to use your trades aggressively? Uh, by aggressively, I mean just use your trades to ditch players who are not performing. Mm-hmm. Uh, if someone doesn't turn up for even two or three games, that's like one third of the season this time, the BBL Supercoach season. Like, do you, uh, like, just get rid. I think that's, that's, you know, uh, I think that's one of the things that jumps out right away. What do you reckon, Nicole? Yep, I'll back you up on that. Um, So I'll say, like, I'm big on, I used to be big on, like, going my gut instinct and, you know, oh, this season will have, this player will have a breakout season, all that kind of stuff. But I think the fact that it is a shorter season and less rounds, l- less games and less rounds, there's also a, um something to say for if that player that you've got isn't quite working out, you'll have an excuse to trade them anyway because you'll have to follow the highs and lows of who's got the double game weeks. Um, so I think that's even more incentive to, you know, if the person, if the player that you've backed in isn't performing and has like a single game week or a buy, it's like a no brainer, just get rid of them. Whereas, you know, if you back someone in who's a bit of a pod, but they've got a double game week coming up, maybe you give them one last chance. So I feel like, again, you know, I think the recurring thing from last week, a lot of these decisions mm. are the game is making for you. Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, uh, what you're saying, like, with the doubles and the buys is like really, really important. And I think we're, we're the, the sort of two things that we touched on right now in terms of, well, the, because there are lots of players who have, well, there are players who have doubles in every round. So there'll always be someone to go to. And the shorter season means you have no patience for underperformers. I think those two things are kind of, they both, I think, fall under trading aggressively um, to sort of ditch the guys who aren't performing, get in the guys who have doubles and just like really really attack the game, I think. Uh, the situations, like basically you mentioned both last week and this week, the situation's already there for you. It's already been created. You have doubles and you have all these buys. Half, 
half the teams have been blocked off for you because of the because of the buys half the teams have been enabled for you because of the because of the doubles so maybe not think too much about it um the only thing i will say to that is uh, i wonder if there's room for maybe a slightly different approach maybe like what i call the fine tuning approach in my show notes which i'm looking at right now so this is how this is how i see it okay um so it's a shorter season which means there's lots of doubles and lots of buys uh, in fact round eight is the only one without any doubles or buys um now if you set your team up carefully enough before the season um which means not going too hard on too many heat players only essentially that's that, that's what it means um you can you could probably go a bunch of rounds where you just need to make like a couple of changes here and there in order to get like five or six players in that particular game which would ensure that you have much greater coverage across the round i mean i'm sure you you've been in the situation before where let's say you have a four game round and you you you're like absolutely armed to the teeth for three out of those four games but there's this random bottom of the table renegades v thunder game on like a Let's Thursday not make night with you. Like the Renegades and Thunder. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, where, where you just have no coverage and you have like, or you have like maybe one Alex Hales or something like that, um, yeah. and and you just have no interest in that game from a super coach point of view. But but then that's the game where I don't know. There's like a blowout performance, you know, and there's like 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 a like a seventy five or an eighty of eighty or forty or something like that, and. Um, yeah, well, the, it's essentially. The, the, sorry, yeah, I was right. going to say there's probably two things I could add there. You made two really good points there. You made uh, this isn't relevant to your exact point, but you made a really interesting note around. There's only one by uh, one round where there's no double game weeks. I found in previous years um, when I have had the time to sit down and actually plan out a few weeks in advance, those ones are perfect to get out of who you're overstacked on and to get into who you want, obviously, for the next round. So that's one interesting thought a thought that I had. The other thing is, I think this year, like now that Sashane's had a year of or a practice run last season, and you're obviously putting a lot more effort and you've got a lot more experience with Supercoach, I think this year watching me and Sashane's teams will be really interesting because um, I assume we'll both go with our teams as per our personalities. So I usually love going <laughs> Um, and I was actually, you mentioned a point around, you know, if people are going hard on heat players early, there'll be a point where you need to offload heat players. Um, so my thought process with that was almost, we'll of course have to wait for predicted teams. And if the heat team is kind of crap and I, I can't even find six guys I like, then this might go out the window. But I'm even thinking of like going super, super hard on heat players, knowing that I think it's the strikers round two. Um, so I think like my thought process was like, go super hard, like maybe like a six heat players, which seems like overkill, I know, but I feel like a lot of people like won't want to do that. Um, and just on on this note, very quickly, Ben from Honeyball, um, the Honeyball put out a, a message today. There's a PM11 or the, the some sort of game that might affect round one. Mm. Michael Nisa, you'd think would be a good shout for that game. So I think that'll sort of throw the cat amongst the pigeons a little bit as well. So um, most likely, I reckon I'll go a little bit risky early, go really hard on the heat. And then just like have a bit of a safety net and try to go hard on the strikers round two as well. It's probably going to cost me at some point, but um, I really loved, I think I told you guys, uh, I told you, Sashen, I know that last BBL and this NRL BB, uh, super coach and fantasy season, I've come roughly top, top 1% in all three. And the main tweak mm. that I've made is I used to always try to have like a, uh, a safer or like fun approach and potty approach to the start of the season. Instead, what I've started mm. doing in the last 12 months is try to be like at the very top from the first round and let it, let t things take care of themselves from there. So anyways, I'll stop myself now, but really mm. interested to see how uh, your approach might vary. Yeah. No, really interesting. I mean, uh, what, what you, uh, what you, what you just mentioned about both the strikers and about the, uh, like going hard early and trying to establish a lead early on. Uh, that actually, I think, I think you might find some value in the approach that I just laid out. Weirdly enough, counterintuitive though it sounds. My uh, my whole point being that uh, let's say that, that so there's one approach which you just mentioned, which is to go like four, five, six heat players at the start for round one. There's another approach which is what I just mentioned, the fine tuning approach, which is where you get let's say a couple of gates, a couple of stars, a couple of scorches, a couple of sixers, maybe three heat. Um, sort of like really, really balance it out so you're reasonably well covered for the doubles that are to come, which essentially means that, let's say, in round three, when both the stars and the renegades double, you could possibly have like seven, eight players 
if you use your trades like if you use your trades even if you just like use a couple of trades in uh, to bring in those guys ahead of that time because you'll already be starting with mm. three four uh renegades and heat players or uh, renegades and uh, stars players rather um but uh the the other sort of upside to this in terms of like the really expensive premium assets is um if you nail these like these these good value or these or these or these pods early um like these guys who just keep taking over and you know who who get their 30 points in peace out as i kind of mentioned last time um but uh if you nail those kinds of players you know the guys in the sort of like the 111 k's 100 115 k's those kinds of guys 120 k's um and you have enough coverage across the round you can then start attacking your doubles with the expensive trades you know um this is what brings me to strikers in round 2 uh you probably want more strikers than you want heat in round 2 uh just because of the double and if you got to this if you got to this balance with your team where you've managed to get where you've managed to follow the fine tuning approach you've got a couple of um you've got you've got a couple of renegades and scorchers etc 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 then you can um like go aggressive and then just get in like a match shot and a rush of con just for that double uh you can go and get in like Jai Richardson for the Scorchers double. You can get in, let's say, just 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 go for Quinton De Kock and the Gates double in three. You know those kinds of things. Um, so I think it really enables you to spend those trades on the really premium assets who you can and 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 the reason they're important is because they're legitimate captaincies in every round. Every every round that you bring them in, I think that's I think really important to emphasize. Right. I got two points on your next point. Um, I think you you mentioned like the overarching point is. there's going to be a whole bunch of short form tournaments going on at that time plus australian national commitments and potentially like a whole bunch of international white ball tours it it there's a there's a whole bunch going on um honeyball is obviously a great uh great um page to check out in terms of going into detail about what's going on which players might be missing etc um and i think your general point was like holding trades for those commitments and and obviously like being wary of what's going on um i think again we're going to have Yes, I do obviously think it's smart to have trades and and be wary of what's going on, but again I've gone the other approach in terms of like my thought process this year is with the shorter less rounds mm. less etc. There won't be any Perth scorchers resting a bowler towards the end because they'd be done. It's only how, yeah. how many games is each team playing 10 or 11 I think it is this year instead Just of need too many. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah I've not too many. 14 for the last few years and I think this year it's like 11. Yeah. So um so obviously with a shorter tournament and I think there's like a one week break between rounds or something like that as well like it's a very between round 1 and 2 yes. there's like 6 days off I think yeah 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 so I think anyways this year like teams will be a lot more like hopefully it's a closer tournament as well and there's no teams that sort are of making breakaway leads and stuff essentially what I'm trying to get at is like unless someone is genuinely injured I don't think teams are going to be in the position to be resting players which is awesome for mm. point of view like a BBL game yes. point of view and obviously from our team's point of view we don't have randomly like a scorcher's bowler pulling out just because they're doing no. so long, so long so i think yeah. um, again in the case of going all in going all in i'm hoping again it's one of those where it's like hey you know if mm. someone you didn't expect like you've got a an english white ball player who's been like yeah dominant for your big ball for the big bash team for your super coach team out of nowhere they get selected in some english white ball squad hey like mm. cop that is my approach but i think with your balance yeah. it's like maybe try to be a little bit wise and and hold off on yeah. what you're trying to say um i mean let me let me let me put it this way the wisdom of this approach or lack thereof will only be revealed when i'm like 20000 places behind you in the, in the standings um i think <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i mean i think there is obviously merit to going hard early i was just exploring i think alternative approaches in terms of how and this is what brings me back to trades right um uh, um this is actually the perfect time to discuss it and i have like honeyball's fixture availability calendar was invaluable in being able to spot this pattern i think over the course of the season uh, what you mentioned about hopefully let's say sixers said let's say sixers who had this 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 issue of rotation or rotating bowlers last year if you remember maybe if if let's say teams don't have that anymore or they have that less this season that might be helpful um but if you look at the first half of the bbl season this year there are a lot of the conflicting commitments are international games so australia playing home test against pakistan india and south africa are playing a few t20s uh, england and west indies those uh, like those are some very those are i think conflicting white ball games for like 
genuinely like for super coach options obviously india south africa indian players aren't really a relevant factor right so um but we uh england's white ball squads have been announced for that for that series by the way um i think we're sure now that zach crawley is going to miss the first round something like that um i'll, I'll have to double check but i think zach crawley is okay. definitely going to miss the some some yeah the first first couple of coaches games of the season so um if there's somebody if there's and obviously you have to have a think about this from the point of view of your team but if there's somebody you really want who's going to be unavailable in the first half of the season decock is a, a potential example you may want to hold trades and then use a bunch of them uh when the international commitments are done and players become available closer to the middle of the season um whether it's like a zach crawley or a quinter decock etc i think if you have that and 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 to hold trade not so much in terms of uh well don't make trades early or don't try to attack early fixtures or don't try to pick uh don't try to pick guns etc but like if there's somebody you really want from uh let's say you really want from scorchers maybe you don't want maybe, maybe you might think oh i want zach crawley but he's not going to be available should i get i don't know ashton turner and hope he gets me the same kinds of returns um it's not exactly the same role um it might be worth i think sort of attacking some of those clubs is later uh, doubles in the season for example i think scorchers double again in like 6 6 yeah. and 7 and if crawley is available for that he might be worth using uh, an extra trade on for example yeah yep. and i think um, you mentioned trade boost i'm very much used to i spend a lot more time on nrl super coach obviously 6 months of the season can you very quickly yeah. explain what the go is with trade boost this bbl and then i can kind of talk to that as well Yes, so as somebody who's relatively new to Super Coach, I think trade boosts are quite cool. So up to two times a season, you can activate a fourth trade for a particular round. Um, so you normally get maximum three per round. You can get a fourth two times a season, depending on well, you can do you can you can choose to use it whenever. Uh, and I'm just sort of thinking about it with the conflicting commitments in terms of both the international games in the first half of the season and a lot of the T20 leagues in the second half of the season, the SA20, the ILT20, and you know those kinds of leagues uh, chris lin for example is one of those guys who left midway uh, last season to go play in the ilt20 i think adam zampa played some ilt20 games etc um so you might want to use trade boosts let's say to there, there so there are two schools of thought with trade boosts right one you want to you one you want to use a trade boost to get in players you want or uh, two you want to use the trade boost to offload the players you really have to get rid of because of buys or them leaving for other leagues or going to play for australia or whatever right um so you may want to start with available players and then start mass selling when they start leaving for these other leagues so that's one possible use of the trade boost but that's like a fairly sort of like a general strategy i thought of looking through the season and the calendar bit by bit and sort of identify possible windows for trade boosts so i went through a few of them and i thought it'd be good to to go through a few of them uh, i i found a few of them and i thought it'd be good to go through uh, some of them right now uh, and obviously this will depend on what the structure of your team is and uh, Uh, where you find yourself at various points in the season, but depending on planning a team, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends on uh, uh, well. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, yeah. So um, I think it, it it obviously will come back to how much coverage you have from a particular team, etc. But um, I thought it was a good idea to start with the heat, um, the trade boosts in relation to the heat. now obviously if you're attacking let's say the four, the triple in round one with like four four five six heat players uh you may have to in like a general sense front load your trades at the start of the season to get these guys out replace them because they have a buy in three and i think stars have a buy in two so if you start with any stars you need to get rid of those those guys as well so you'll have to get rid of heat um get in strikers get in stars get in renegades ditch heat ditch strikers uh did stars you know so there's a lot of uh, like if you do go with a lot of heat early and a lot, lot of maybe a lot of stars early there's a lot of you probably have to front load your trades a lot in the start of the season um now a trade boost might help you achieve that uh one window to use your trade boosts if you start with a lot of heat is round 3 which is where they have a buy so you can use your trade boost to get rid of your heat guys um if you start with a few stars or renegades the fine tuning approach i mentioned earlier uh it might be worth using a boost in 4 uh which is when both of them double um or do they double in 3 i think they double uh, they double in 3 yeah. they double in 3 my bad that's right yeah so 
uh, it might be worth using the boost in three to get in uh, a bunch of uh, Star and Gates guys. Uh, really a tank that round. Also, um, just just let, let, like let's say he just completely get caught like deer in headlights, and it's all one way traffic in one of their triple games. Yeah, and it just ends up being like a like it just ends up being a disaster for your three four heat guys. Um, one of the things with with using your trade boost to attack a, a round, which is round three, where two two claims double. Uh, you're sort of almost spreading your risk across uh, two different games. So hopefully you'll get something out of it. You know, let's say you end up with six players across the stars in the gate. It's the same number as you might start in round one, but it's not the same club. So it's two different games, two different sets of conditions, two different sets of grounds, different sets of players, different potential form, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, just to sort of keep alive that possibility. Um, the third possible window is if you start with scotches and you hold them throughout the first few rounds. Uh, as you mentioned last time, they have a buy in four and in five. So you might want to use the boost to get rid of Scorchers heading into four. So you use your fourth, you get rid of them, you'll be like you 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 you'll be in great shape heading into four, having got rid of your scorchers. The other side of round five, they have doubles in both six and seven. So you may want to use your trade boost alternatively to get scorchers in for round six, or you might want to use both boosts. Uh, in that middle phase of the season, get them out in four and get them back in again in six. You That's me on that. That sounds awesome. If if a team's got two doubles in a row, trying to get max and, and it's a gun team, trying to get them mm. that little four game window. Um, the only thing that I would say, this is me sort of uh, overthinking things a little bit. Will someone like Jai Richardson, Jai Richardson, who's coming back from injury, will he play four games in what nine, ten days, or whatever it ends up being? I'd be a little bit wary of that. And I know, like in previous years, that's something that I've struggled with. I was actually having a conversation on Twitter with someone, and they were saying, like, from a statistical point of view, bowlers and all rounders are obviously the best, then bowlers, then batsmen. And I was just saying that, like, like I'd obviously do all the other, like, think about everything else first. And then if I was stuck at someone as a belt bowler or a batsman, I like going the batsman just because it's just like such a, a simpler watch and no stress about resting and mm. stuff. But from a like a numbers point of view, obviously bowlers are much more consistent. You get the economy rate, dot balls, wickets are easier to get, like get one or two of, et cetera, et cetera. Batsman could get you yeah. five and nothing else all day, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so funny. Like I'm the exact opposite. I would much rather captain bowlers. Like yes. I think, <laughs> I, would, I, would that. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Someone's oh, muting whenever I talk, or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I mean, I, I'm just thinking back to, and this has always been a thing with me, right? Uh, like I'm thinking back to like years and years and years ago when I used to play IPL fantasy, you know, and it was always. For me, it was always like a Sunil Narayan or like a Dwayne Bravo or, you know, like when, like at their peak when they were just guaranteed captaincies. I mean, if, if, uh, uh, if you kids think uh, Rashid Khan is kind of like, like a, like a Su Sunil Narayan was, was a bit like that, yeah. uh, where he was just this, this gun spinner who was just nailed on to bowl four overs each time. And he almost became too successful for his own good, where they just started playing him out in kind of the same so way that you do with Rashid right, right now. Right? Isn't that what happened to him last BBL? Isn't that why his price is uh, noticeably lower? Yeah, I think I think I think you're right. He's actually a lot more affordable now than um, hmm. what he was last season, if I remember. Yep. Um, yep. He, he yeah. is. Because I saw his price and I was shocked, and I was like, he wasn't injured, so the only excuse could be like the fact that he was just being teams are just playing him out basically. Um, mm -hmm. And I think like uh, there's two reasons why, you know, picking a bowler, I think the easy way to say, like say it is, oh, bowlers statistically do better than batsmen. That's like the quick and easy thing to say, right? But what I was trying to get at is if a bowler is priced, the, or has averaged the same as a batsman and he's priced pretty much the same, mm -hmm. you can't say, oh, the bowler's better. It's just that like they score their points in different ways. So then what you're going for is your your risk appetite. Which is why I was saying I'd go all in on the yeah. bat for a big knock every time. Maybe it's the I think what does my head in with bowlers is just like maybe it's because I am a batsman. Like I just think like a batsman, I can kind of picture what's going to happen, and it's kind of like if he gets out, like ah, okay, that's his skill. The thing with bowlers, especially with quick bowlers like an Andrew Ty, the fact that you're mm. really on that death over for him to just go bang, bang, bang and get those two or three cheap wickets, like I both. Mm. 
that. So I think like I just feel more in control with the batsman, thinking like this dude's just got to go nuts. Whereas with a bowler, it's a little bit like mm. they bowl first, it's perfect because he's going to get those mm. couple of at the end that you think. But what if they bowl second? And what if they're chasing down really quickly and he doesn't get that last over? Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's my desire to be in control of the situation. I don't know. <laughs> I do love the thought yeah. of Ben McDermott, like a, a guy who's capable of scoring hundreds. And you just know that he's going to flop and piss you off. But just that like expectation. <laughs> like, oh, if he's my captain, I've got it all on the line. I love that. Yes. Okay. It's so funny. Like I think about it in exactly the opposite way. It's always for me. This is, I mean, I, mean, I made a little note about dual, uh, dual position traits um, in, my, in my sort of show notes, you know, which is where basically if you have dual role players, you can uh, fit them in in the different slots that you have for the different roles, right? Or you can fit them in in both slots that you have for the different roles. Glenn Maxwell is a great example. So you could fit in guys who are all-rounders in the bowling slots. Um, yeah. But again, in terms of trades, I honestly think it might be worth using your trades to get in bowlers, you know, like pure bowlers, frontline bowlers, not just all-rounders. I don't know how many, like I'd have to look into this a little bit more, but I don't know how many uh, dual position players are really like, they even have close to a, the role of a frontline bowler, you know. Um, uh, I honestly think that if, if if they do, they're worth spending, uh, they're worth spending your trades on. Um, yeah. Let's say, uh, like, I, I I'd love to get in like a Tom Rogers. He has a good game that either right now. But what I will do is like for if you are mm-hmm. a super coach and you just check out our pod because it's one of the only podcasts that are out this early um in the preseason. I will say if you, if if I can just imagine like my super coach screen. I won't share my screen and stuff just now. But you got your batsman at the top, your keepers, and your bowlers, right? So what we're trying to say by like dual position trades is if you have like uh, a pure batsman, let's just say like an Alex Hales, right, and you want to trade him out for uh, an Andrew Ty, for example, who's only... Mm. So what you can do is you can trade out Alex Hale from your batsman. Say Glenn Maxwell, who's an all-rounder, dual position. If he's currently a bowler in your team, you can trade out your mm. batsman, sub Maxwell over to the batting section in place of Hale, yes. and then trade in a bowler, let's say Andrew Ty. Yes. So that is possible with Supercoach. Uh, you might need to sometimes on mobile and desktop, it doesn't work cleanly. So you may need to test it out mm. a couple of times. But usually the feature is there um, and it's a really mm. good one to play around with. So many times I've been caught out in NRO mm. season thinking, oh man, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then you just have like an odd mixture of, ah, oh, but if I just move that guy there, oh wow, that opens up a whole bunch yes. of other players I couldn't afford. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. That's actually a really, really, really important point. I think um, just, um, I mean, it, it, like sometimes trades might look obvious, but um just give it a little bit of thought, like just look at your options and maybe, maybe make the trade, maybe like slightly more with, with like you experiment a little bit more and then finalize your trade. That's what I want to say. Um, I think especially with, uh, especially when you have like overflowing rounds with like three doubles or a triple, there are just so many ways that you could play that. Um, I think it's worth sort of playing around with your trades a little bit and playing around with your dual positions and playing around with your player roles and just to see if you can find a combination that you're happy with. Because I think this this whole thing about getting the team that you're happy with is really important. I think that's something we touched on in the last episode as well. Um, You can get to a team that you're happy with, even if you're not happy with the team currently. And your trade strategy might be central to achieving that happiness. (laughs) And I was just going to say, like, I'm just moving away from trades just for a second. In in terms of... um... I know as like someone who uh, this early in the preseason, I usually don't make my first team or if I do, like I'll make it once and then I'll wait till a bit closer to have your teams to start really tinkering with my team. Um, But I I had my first crack at making a team over the weekend. We'll do like a a team reveal or something at some point um, closer to the the season starting. So Shane, but uh, what I was going to say was when I started to started to do my team, uh, I looked at the honey ball, um, calendar in terms of doubles triples buys etc their calendar there is absolutely awesome i wouldn't stress too much about form and injuries and availability just yet i think like obviously do that (laughs) closer to the season but have a look at the double like the the schedule calendar from honeyball obviously get into actually making your team and just start like planning for those first two or three rounds just to get the shape or like a skeleton of a team together. And I'll tell you, like as someone who's obsessed with BBL and BBL super coach and BBL punting and everything, having that first play around with the team makes a huge difference. Cause I think I only spent maybe hmm. 10 minutes on it, but I was shocked by, um, cause obviously on the BBL super coach site, you can, um, 
you can select, I only want to look at players from these teams. So I excluded all yes. the ones that have at least a double the first round. And some of the mm. players shocked me. So I think um, you can yeah. have a lot of fun just with uh, just with spending five, 10 minutes trying to make your team. If you are listening to our mm. podcast, any others already up on any of the content that's out there, um, just make your team. You don't have to spend too long on it, but it just gets you in that mm. mindset. So from probably like, you know, a week from now, we'll, is today Monday? Yeah, it is. Well, a week from now, the Cricket World Cup will be done. Um, there's not, obviously, the WBBLs on and NBA and American sports are on, but there's not a whole heap of stuff going on at the moment. So you'll have a little bit of downtime before the BBL does start. Mm. Uh, but you just don't want yeah. to go hard because I know in NRL sometimes, if I'm busy around February, it's just like, oh, crap, I've got a week to digest everything and make my mm. Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. I think uh, uh, just having that that play around with your team and just looking at the prices and the positions, you will find a lot of gems in the prices. We covered some of those in the last episode. You will sort of looking at your sort of like first draft of your team and you're looking at the sort of schedule and you think about the trade boosts and some of the stuff that we covered in this episode. Oh, one, one thing really quickly about the trade boost, by the way. Uh, uh, round seven, in addition to being uh, a Scorchers double, is also uh, a double for uh, two other clubs. Um, so you may want to use a trade boost there. So there's like three doubles in there. So there's Hurricanes, Scorchers, and um, Heat. Yes. Cool. So there are three clubs doubling in round seven. That's another possible option to use your trade boost in, just to make sure that you're well covered. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, one, one thing really quickly about the stars as well. So if you start with stars, so stars double in one, three, and five, they have a buy in two, I think. So if you... Um, start with stars and you hold them. Let's say you have like somebody you can actually afford to shift to the bench, like a Joel Barris, or even if you have started Maxwell and want to shift him to the bench, um, it might be worth using the boost in five or uh, uh, three or in five. So five is the stars' third double of the season. You can really attack that one with like four, five stars if you've got like if you've been holding them this whole time. Use the use the boost, get in an extra star. You'll be set up for five really well. Yeah. I think the other thing to note, and I won't go into detail on this, and but we will do closer to the season, is that at this stage, you know, we haven't got into the detail of predicted teams and actually making your mm. team and then playing around with it. Because as to Shane was saying that, the counterpoint in my mind, and I only learned this from making my team, was that when we say stars, we're saying it so casually because we're looking at the calendar. But then you look at yeah. the players and you're just like, my, my thought was like, oh, maybe I don't need so many stars. So many other teams have the double. It was like, how can you not pick Glenn Maxwell at 118K? <laughs> well, go under the bridge. I think the the later we uh, do, or the closer to the season, the more fun they're going to yeah. be. We can share our screen, pick our teams, go into detail. If we don't do that next yeah. week, we'll do it the week after. But um, anyways, yeah. uh, we, we better wrap it up because I think uh, just one thing I want to very quickly say, we've got, again, Google Wiki link tree, our BBL pod, our BBL stats pages. Uh, what else? We're going to put a BBL article today announcing the prizes for our leagues, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to go into way too much detail about all things BBL Super Coach almost a month out from the season. So watch out for that. If you Google Wiki link tree, it will all be there. Um, but jump onto our Discord as well. I know last year, we had some activity. It was our first season really putting some effort into Supercoach. Mm. From point yeah. of view, we started to get people throwing up their teams and asking for suggestions. Now we've got myself and we've got, uh, we're, we're having a third marketing. Uh, we've got a third full-time marketing person joining our team today. So uh, they all love their cricket and so do I. So we're going to be very, very keen to chat all things Supercoach. Get in the Discord uh, and we'll chat to you over the summer. But otherwise, enjoy the... Um, the Cricket World Cup semi-finals, and hopefully, uh, well, hopefully for me next time we do this pod, to show <laughs> champions. But uh, uh, the Aussie team is is looking very good, so we'll see how the games go. Awesome. Cheers.